All right, let's get started. Thanks again, everyone, for joining uh, this presentation from Synergy Technical titled You're Ready for Microsoft Copilot or Want to Be Ready, but is your data what you need to know as a business leader? Uh, I'm joined today by fellow leaders of Synergy Technical. We'd like to go around the horn and introduce ourselves, and then we'll get into today's agenda. Ro, would you like to get us started? Sure. My name is Ro Mead. I am the CEO of Synergy Technical. Um, and I'm super delighted to be here. Clay Westbay, uh, Vice President of Delivery here at Synergy Technical. Um, I oversee all of our uh, uh, services and solutions and, and uh, experts that help our customers uh, manage, deploy, um, and protect um, all of these great cloud solutions. And I'm Dan Finn. I'm the Vice President of Sales here at Synergy Technical. Been here for five years. Uh, and in the Microsoft space for 12 now. So excited to talk to you about Copilot, about everything we've been a part of in the early access program and how you can get ready uh, from an organizational perspective to roll it out. It's almost as if there was news on this this week. Right. With the number of registrations we have and people joining okay. uh, today's session. So before we get started, let's talk a little bit about Synergy Technical and how we're uniquely positioned to speak on this subject. Synergy was founded in 2011 as a born in the cloud Microsoft partner, one of the first, if not the first. It was really a big bet uh, back in the BPOS and link server days, and someone in this room was right for making that bet. Synergy spent the last coming up on 13 years now engaging in strategic executive consulting, creating IT roadmaps, performing cloud migrations, security and compliance projects, and overall enabling a secure and productive environment for our end users. The microphone was. So as I was saying, Synergy is one of Microsoft's largest direct CSP licensing providers uh, through our software advisory team that's led by certified software asset managers. They help you break down the complexity of licensing. We have an enterprise class managed services business for our clients looking for assistance managing the day-to-day -day IT activities. Led by the two folks in this room with global CIO and IT director backgrounds, Synergy's quickly created a catalog of long-term relationships with our clients. That's led to documented case studies with Microsoft. Sachi Nadella even highlighted one at a World Partner Conference. We've been awarded a Security Deployment Partner of the Year, a top 10 US cloud partner, and number one with Tech for Social Impact for Microsoft 365. We have a dedicated partner manager for Microsoft for both our all up business and our partnership with nonprofits. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jason. I know you're out there. As part of the strength in our Microsoft partnership, we have been included in numerous jumpstart programs. You can think of these as incubators, which gives us early access to tools and technology for early adapters of Microsoft solutions. We've been included in jumpstart programs now for Intune, Windows 365, and now Copilot. We've been in meetings with subject matter experts and product managers of solutions as they become GA, so our team can speak to them, configure them, and manage them. I went back and looked prior to today's session on my first meeting with a subject matter expert at Microsoft on Copilot, and it was May of 2023. So to say we're excited about Monday's announcement might be an understatement. So over our 13 year growth path, we've been able to work across industry deploying over 3 million seats of Microsoft licensing. We've engaged in project work in all 50 states and 70 plus countries. And as anyone here will tell you, we truly excel in highly regulated and complex environments. So today's agenda, let's do a quick overview and then we're gonna jump in to each of these bullet points. We're gonna start with a baseline understanding of Microsoft 365 Copilot. This is Microsoft's AI tool native across the Office applications that you're using in your environment already. We're going to go through key features and potential impact for you as an IT leader, as well as your end users in the organization. Then we're going to go a little more technical for you. We're going to go through the security and compliance controls that you want to look at in your environment prior to rolling out AI. Whatever AI that might be today, we're talking about Microsoft 365 Copilot. Um, if we can do anything, it's to harp, harp on the fact that we really need to focus on bullet points two and three before AI gets deployed in your environment. So we're going to go through identifying the data types in your environment, identifying sensitive data types, understanding the risk of data leakage across your users if you were to enable a tool such as Copilot uh, without performing some of these tasks. And we'll lean on our technical resource here in the room 
to talk in depth on those items. And then we're going to go into change management. I I firmly believe this is critical to rolling out solutions like Copilot. How do we prepare our organization, not just technically, but culturally and from a productivity standpoint to make the most of the investment? So with that, uh, after a quick overview of the agenda, I'm going to lean on Ro as a business leader, as a former global CIO, as now a president of a consulting firm, as a student of AI, having taken classes in this, and now a right. consumer of AI. Big consumer. Talk, talk to us about AI in the workplace. Yeah. Um, so AI is clearly has already transformed the way we work. Uh, if you go back to, and it, it feels like light years ago, but it was really only a little over a year ago that ChatGPT was released into the wild. And that transformed everything. Um, and continues to do so. So generative AI, when most people talk about AI, they're they're talking about generative AI. Obviously, there are other types of AI. It's, generative AI is just a component. Um, but it really has become core to the way that we work, particularly here at Synergy Technical. Uh, so at Synergy Technical, we, we use AI every day. Um, I'm gonna look at my notes here, but we use AI to create meeting summaries, notes and action items. Um, Almost every meeting that we have is recorded and AI generates those meeting notes and the action items related to that. Uh, We use it to generate drafts of marketing content. And I'm gonna say drafts because as with anything, including technology and audio, you need to overlook, you know, you need to look at things before they they get out in the wild. I I would never say that we're gonna use AI to generate something and, and, not have somebody prove that. That's just not going to happen. We use AI to review contracts for missing terms. Again, we we may do that, but that doesn't mean contracts go out without attorneys reviewing them because you certainly want that. We use AI for forecast resource utilization, um, for forecasting resource utilization, key to us figuring out when we have resources available to do what. Um, HR for updating and creating job descriptions. I think every day somebody is reviewing PowerShell scripts and and other things with with AI. Um, So we use it for a whole bunch of things. And that has all transpired over the past year, I would say, and probably realistically really the past six months. So Mm -hmm. there's just no doubt for me that AI already has and will continue to change how we work. And I I can't even envision what two years from now is going to look like. I just can't. Yeah. so an overview of Microsoft 365 Copilot. What I will say is if you're on this call and you're a technology leader, you've been under a rock if you haven't seen or heard <laughs> of Microsoft 365 big Copilot. Rock. Big rock, a big, big rock. Um, Copilot is a powerful productivity tool that you can use within the, the Microsoft applications. A lot of people have used ChatGPT, and I'm going to compare and contrast them a little bit because I I think that's a good grounding point to talk about what Copilot really is. Uh, If you've used ChatGPT, ChatGPT is really, really good at generating content. You can you can go to ChatGPT and you can say, okay, I want to write a blog about Microsoft 365 Copilot, and you can give it some points, and it'll it'll write that blog, and and that's all good. where Copilot is a little is a lot different, really, is you can do something with that. And so, if if I want to create a presentation like this one about Microsoft 365 Copilot, I can upload notes from that. Maybe you know I might have used Copilot to create it. I might have used ChatGPT. It doesn't matter. I can upload those notes, and Copilot within PowerPoint will then dynamically create that presentation for me. So it's different in that it can create something from that that LLM text, Mm -hmm. but it also works within the boundaries of your Microsoft 365 environment. So if we if we do the compare and contrast on ChatGPT again uh, in ChatGPT, were I to want to um, maybe upload, uh, I might want to take a some notes from a client meeting and prepare a presentation around that or you know get a summary of it all of our data is labeled um, because you know, client data is, is confidential and so in order for me to do that i would either have to attempt to load it 
to chat GPT, which would fail because it's labeled as confidential, as it should, as it should that, that's what we want to have happen. But now as a user, what I would really have to do is I would have to unlabel that, which is now creating a security risk because now I have unlabeled data within my environment. I would then have to remove all of the client references for that data because I don't want to load anything into ChatGPT that has client specific information and then load it up. So that process takes a lot longer. Whereas if I'm working within the, the Microsoft 365 Copilot, I don't have to unlabel it to do that. I don't have to remove all that client specific information. It knows because I have authorization to that data and to that file that it can then produce whatever it is that I'm asking it to do. Um, so they're similar and, and one is sort of the underpinning of, of the other, but what Microsoft 365 Copilot is doing is taking that LLM technology so much further. It, it's just so much further. Uh, potential impacts in the workplace. I want to make sure that I'm hitting everything that you told me I had to talk about. <laughs> um, potential impacts in the workplace really are, are twofold. The first is obviously we're going to see productivity improvements. We better see productivity improvments. We'll see them. Let, let me be clear. Um, we're going to see the automation of routine tasks, things that Maybe we might have routinely had an intern do because it's, I don't, I don't want to say grunt work, but it's grunt work. Mm -hmm. um, we might offload to a Microsoft 365 Copilot. Um, but I think the other thing that we're going to see is that people are going to become really a lot more sensitive to, and they should be already, but a lot more sensitive to the security in their environment and how things are categorized and how they're labeled. And I know we're going to talk about that later, mm -hmm. but to me, this feels like the catalyst for getting all those security projects done that needed to be done previously that we, you know, have recommended and haven't necessarily been taken on. In the end, I think it's going to make everything just so much faster. It, what what LLMs did initially with their introduction, really with ChatGPT's introduction a year ago, this is going to be exponentially faster. So. I don't know if I've answered your question, but in many ways, I actually want to call out one of the items you mentioned. I, I use the word Trojan horse in this experience, but we have a lot of IT leaders on the phone and you've probably pitched some security improvements or some data labeling or some DLP policies that most likely guessing here, but most likely uh, your executive team is the one that shot it down. They have to click an extra label to label their email. They got to click an extra label to label their document. This can be the broader you know we're bringing ai into the business our it can be the hero doing that and the trojan horse is you get some security initiatives done by doing so so in order to bring ai into the business we had to roll out document yeah. labeling we had to roll out dlp access reviews things that clay can help us talk about right yeah now. i mean i think um as dan was saying you know we, we've certainly helped deploy a ton of security solutions for customers in the cloud um, and a lot of those solutions were um, what I'll call the low hanging fruit or things that were um, not as impactful to the users or the business, um, such things as MFA, Microsoft uh, 365 Defender. But when preparing for Copilot, what we're really going to want to focus in on, there's kind of three core areas that we'll talk about today. Um, yeah, this isn't going to be a technical deep dive by any means, but this is kind of the high level of what you uh, want to want to focus in on as you begin to prepare for Copilot. We certainly have the uh, certified experts, um, you know, all across the US and the globe to help dive into these areas. But those areas for Copilot readiness are going to be um, number one, understanding your data. So that's the first thing we'll talk about. And then classifying and labeling your data. That's that we'll dive into that. Ro touched on that. Um, and then applying DLPs. So those are kind of the three foundational uh, things that you're going to want to focus on as you prepare your organization from a security and compliance perspective. A new phrase I learned around understanding your data was the holistic data estate. <laughs> I learned this back in May of 23, and I had to ask the engineer we're working with, like, define that for me. <laughs> it doesn't define itself. <laughs> now it's pretty easy. but that's what you mean there's going to be some uh yeah there's going to be some new uh buzz phrases that come out of this copilot here so um one is going to be what you're going to hear a lot of is called just enough access um so you're going to hear um that so when it comes to microsoft copilot as ro mentioned it can do a lot of these great uh things that can 
pull in different documents and summarize information and even generate content. But what we need to make sure is that our users have just enough access. Um, so that's two things. You know, we can have users in our organization that are over provisioned, right? So we they have um, access to links maybe that someone else sent them through OneDrive. Mm -hmm. They have uh, access to uh, mailboxes, um, terminated user uh, data. Um, so if they have access to it um, today, Microsoft 365 Copilot is going to respect those permissions, right? Um, on the opposite side of that, uh, you may have users that are under permissioned, don't have enough access to uh, what they would like in order to generate the content that they're looking to generate with Copilot. So your answer to that is Microsoft Purview Data Protection Solutions. And so Microsoft Purview um, can go in and help you um, see where you may be over provisioned and where you may be under provisioned and then give you recommended steps to take in order to, to uh, close that gap. Um, and then we've got things like access reviews that we can implement so we can implement workflows um, to make sure that access is regularly being reviewed by data owners. And then we've got um, things like uh, privileged identity management so we can make sure that folks don't just have admin controls or admin rights out there broadly all the time, but that there's an approvals process and a workflow to go through that. When we talk about understanding our data, it's really understanding where your sensitive data is located today, right? And that's different for every organization. And depending on your compliance uh, requirements, that, that's going to be different for you. But Microsoft Purview is going to allow you to understand your data, define the key terms, and apply the templates uh, that that a apply to your compliance regulations to help you identify that data. Um, but that's where data protection comes in into place with uh, data cl classification and labeling. So that's really so once you understand your data and you've used purview to kind of see where you're oversharing, undersharing, defining key uh, sensitive information, the next step is really to go and, and look at data classification and labeling. So we can label documents to, for example, make them internal um, so that um, we're not oversharing information externally. Um, or um, if we have sensitive HR data, we can label them in such a way that only certain folks have access to it. And like Rose said, Microsoft 365 Copilot is going to respect those labels, and it's also going to help you apply those labels appropriately um, when you're generating content with Copilot. The key here is though those that that classification that labeling has to be in place before you deploy Copilot out into the organization. Yes. Just steal a phrase you've been running with. It doesn't change your permissions, but it amplifies them. Certainly, I mean Copilot um, is as many of if 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 you've um, uh, experienced ChatGPT and some of the others out there, you know that it is really really good at search. It's a powerful search engine it like Rose said it, it does generate content but um, your users uh, uh, if they have access and they're giving these prompts to copilot they're absolutely going to find that content yeah so i'm going to add to that and we see this all the time with customers we see it a lot when we're doing things like migrating file servers to sharepoint online or, or onedrive in a lot of cases users have access to data that they don't realize that they have access to and that's all well and good when it's hard to find that data so it's nested down deep a, a bunch of layers and a bunch of folders if all of a sudden you you remove all of that and you take all of that out now in a scenario where maybe you have a comp plan that has not been labeled appropriately as HR only and it's saved in a, a folder somewhere in SharePoint or whatever, um, and this certainly happens, a user could get to it. And I can almost guarantee that what is what we're going to see six weeks from now is that a lot of people are really excited about Copilot. 
and they're going to go out and they're going to go buy licenses for Copilot and they're going to deploy Copilot and they're not going to think through the security side of that. And we're going to be getting phone calls saying a word that I can't say publicly. My data is now, you know, maybe it's not out in the wild, but now end users have access to data that they absolutely shouldn't. And I had no idea that was coming. And that's that's going to happen. Yeah. So our, our message, if you again, over and over again, you got to get the security straight before you set this thing out. Absolutely. You just have to. Yeah, and I think, you know, as like, like I was saying, this is the understanding the data piece is, is more involving the business. It's, um, you know, coming up with those those policies and standards across your business. And that takes agreement from the business. It's not just an IT, um, you know, task here or, or security initiative. It's it's the business getting involved. Um, and so I think that's kind of the piece that um, tends, uh, organizations tend to stumble on is just that first. But I think once once they do get that understanding and they've worked with the business to define that key sensitive information, you know, we're able to to move to that next step, which is the labeling and classification. And then once we get that label and classification in place, then we can move to um, the data loss prevention policies or DLP policies, which are going to help us, um, you know, ensure that data is not leaving our organization that shouldn't be leaving our organization. Um, as a result of Copilot, right? Um, and then we can apply these templates that Microsoft has available to us to um, protect social security numbers, bank information, HR data, and any custom trainable classifiers that you know we deem uh, is necessary for the business. While we're talking about data too, I think it's important to understand in our, we have a readiness assessment. We'll talk more about that at the end here, but in our readiness assessment, to hit on a couple of key, key things that Clay just mentioned, we talk about your use cases and your user profiles. And when we identify them, you may expand to data sources that are outside of your Microsoft 365 tenant. So we can do everything data governance, security compliance, access reviews through purview. But then there are scenarios where HR wants to pull workday data or we want to pull data from a Oracle CRM system. Are there connectors and plugins to leverage Copilot against those systems? There are. But what are we doing by exposing that extra data, right? So in our readiness assessment, understanding the holistic data estate, the word comes back to haunt me, uh, is key. And it's against your use cases and your user profiles, because not everybody across the organization will need those integrations beyond the 365 tenant. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as, as Dan mentioned, I think the place that the, the the solution that we keep hearing over and over is Microsoft Purview, and I think Microsoft has really done a good job of putting everything uh, that you need to protect your data into the solution. I will say for a lot of organizations, diving into Purview can be a pretty overwhelming because there's just a lot there. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, each one of these sections, we could probably have a couple hour deep dive session on. Um, and so that's why, you know, these are kind of the high level items that you uh, you want to tackle. But, you know, then we have compliance manager to stack on top of that, right? So we've got, um, you know, all of our CMMC, our uh, HIPAA regulations. And so compliance manager is going to allow us to um, bring in those uh, templates. And now that we have these controls in place, we can begin to track how we are doing against um, our compliance requirements right within the compliance manager. So I think Microsoft has done a great job of having these assessments kind of built out and ready for organizations, um, but it can just be a little bit of a challenge navigating that tool and understanding how to update it as it relates to what you've put in place. I'm going to do a quick plug here and then I'm going to jump in with something. Um, first thing is that a lot of customers don't understand what they really have with their Microsoft Security Suite and what they're licensed for, what it does. We do have an engagement, which is free, uh, mm -hmm. called a Security CIE, which is designed to give you a, a really great view into the Microsoft Security stack and, and how you can use that to secure your environment. And I would say that if you're even considering rolling out Copilot, it may be worthwhile even to just go through one of those security CIEs Absolutely. To, to make sure that you understand how, not necessarily the, you know, flip this switch and do this and flip this thing. Um, 
I'm making that sound so easy, but <laughs> at least what the tool set can do. And then we can start talking about how we're going to do it. Um, the other thing that I would say is that Synergy Technical is almost 13 years old. I can't remember now, it's been so long. Uh, we have been labeling our data for at least 10 years since since it has been available. And we're, we're what's called a born in the cloud partner. So we all of our data resides within Azure or or Microsoft 365, you know, some some LB systems, but for the most part there. We are not and and we are a security partner of the year. We are not rolling out Copilot to all of our users without going through and doing this internal assessment yet again, because I don't want to be in a scenario where we in it inadvertently expose something even internally that we shouldn't. So mm -hmm. as good as we are, we want to go through an audit and check and make sure that we're not going to be in a scenario where somebody ended up with something that they shouldn't have. Absolutely. And I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned the word audit um, that that's going to be a key point is kind of going back, reviewing um, what your policies are around e-discovery, um, around auditing so that you can make sure that Microsoft Copilot and what's being put into Copilot is included in that. So you're making sure, yep. you know, that you're able to meet your existing obligations and requirements related to policies. Yep. Fun. The compliance manager tool set is pretty impressive, especially when you look at the regulations across different countries, across even, you know, I hear from a customer call this week, Germany now might win for the worst uh, compliance requirements or the hardest on the IT director. <laughs> but now each security might say best compliance requirements. Best, yes. California came in with some, Virginia yeah. came in with some, the states are all going to be creating their own individual if we don't have federal guidelines that follow that. But you see those AI bills passing through government fairly quickly or getting prioritized fairly quickly too. So um, this can all change and you're going to see the Microsoft Purview and Compliance Manager tool set adapt to that and help you manage your environment. I'll even give a freebie as it comes to best practices and data cleansing. And thank you, Clay. You did a, a fantastic job boiling two hour workshop down in <laughs> 15 minutes. Um, but a freebie would be, you know, one area that sort of raised my eyebrow and I continue to bring this up would be when you look at version control and naming conventions of, of your documents, like Clay had on Copilot is going to read the latest version of your document, right? So can we identify use cases or user profiles where we might want to run Copilot prompts against previous versions? I think of revision history. I think of contract processes going through red lines, SOWs, contracts, maybe uh, offer letters. What are the most frequent clauses that get asked for revision? We can't run that Copilot prompt if we've saved the document under the same name over and over again to have the latest version. So if we have that scenario identified, we need to work with your end users or that group within your organization to say, do we want to go with a V1, V2, V3 policy? Do we want to name, uh, I like using the date structure, right? 2024 for today's date. Uh, you need to look at your naming conventions in order to allow Copilot to see all the versions where you are storing those files. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, you know, it's it once you, once you have your understanding of your data, it's 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 um, you know creating these standardizations across your organization that maybe weren't so uh, front and center, but now will be with Copilot, right? Standard date formats, standard addressing, naming conventions, as you just mentioned, um, but also updating outdated information, correcting errors in information, removing duplicates. Um, you know that that's those are the types of things that maybe um, aren't at the forefront of everybody's right. mind, but now will be as a result of Copilot. Um, well, especially if Copilot finds the same document four different times and cites it four different times. I mean, it, <laughs> the opportunities here, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, so I mean, if if we you know if we want really good user adoption and we want a good user experience which everybody wants that security and compliance but you know you have to balance it with the end user as well then you know these are the things that are going to give them a good experience right if we have clean data optimized data the other thing to note in the, these tools is they really like stru well structured data mm. um, it needs to be accessible to the user right. of course but um, they perform better um, as the results uh, show uh, with well-structured data. Um, and so 
um, if we have those standards applied, I think the organization is going to get more out of the tool than the organization that doesn't. Yeah, that's huge. Are we missing anything from technical points two and three? There's a lot in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I think the big you know the big takeaway for for us is like I said in the beginning, um, you know we've done a lot of security work sessions, assessments, um, deployments around um, securing the environment, right? But those data projects, as you said, kind of fall sometimes to the back burner just because mm -hmm. of what's involved there. But I think now is the time to really go back. Um, and like Rose said, even if you ha have done that, you got to take a fresh look uh, because yep. it's it's that important. Um, and Microsoft is saying it's critical. So Right. And we're doing the same things internally to reiterate Absolutely. Rose Paint. Yeah. Uh, the same exercises we're talking about here today and ones we can help you with are ones that we're performing internally uh, before this goes org wide. Uh, so Clay hit on a couple areas and then set me up for a clean transition. I think you got a future in sales if you're looking for one, um, but I want to hit on Rose saying no, no. <laughs> I want to hit on preparing your team and there's a there's a couple key areas that we'll we'll talk about here. Um, the first one is awareness for your organization. And I, I posit these questions. If you were to pull your users on what is AI, I gather you would probably get 100 different responses or definitions of what is AI to those individual users. If you were to pull sentiment of your users for AI in the workplace, I gather you would have some concerns. You'd have some, give me now, I can be so much more productive, I can do my job better with it. But you're also going to have those that think it's mining their data. You're going to have those that have concerns about their role in the organization possibly being taken over by AI. It, you need to have clear and concise communication on what is artificial intelligence, what is Microsoft 365 Copilot, and why we're rolling it out to the organization as a way to make your job easier, not a way to replace you. So that building awareness beyond just the technical training, there's some messaging uh, that, that we can talk about in the readiness assessments on how to make this land in a fashion that we're, we're deploying this at, from the IT team uh, to make your life easier, not to make anything more complicated outside of those security tools that we're deploying. Trojan horse, remember that. Um, t t training. On training, I wanted to hit on one key area, and that is we're all aware of technical training. How do I use the tool that IT just deployed? But it's intuitive. You shouldn't have to train me. It should be, right? So I've labeled this creative training. Like it. And take it from a non-creative end user in our environment. All I had seen around Copilot were the Microsoft demos that all ran about 45 seconds long. Perfect. So cool. Yeah, I got Copilot. I can summarize a team's meeting. Give me call to actions. That is helpful. I can come back from a week vacation and summarize my inbox and pull out the high priority emails. That is helpful. But if we spend a little extra time going through a thought exercise on what are some creative uses of Copilot or some out of the box ways to use that, I look at my sales role. I can pull out pipeline in our CRM and pull out forecast and even share this to Clay and say, here's what your engineers and your team looks like they're forecasting out for the next two to three months based on projects we're about to close. I can identify strengths of our sales team based on co-pilot prompts and I can also identify areas to improve. So if we deploy this tool without any specific user profiling specific use cases, there's a lot of user cases. If we deploy this without specifics, right? If you send this to your legal team and said enjoy co-pilot, they might not know how to use it and you're missing huge productivity gains by not giving them two to three specific scenarios and we can help you flush those out. The other is creative prompt writing or creative yes. prompting of AI. And so the analogy I'll use, and then I'm going to ask you to expand on this row as, as I've heard your, your stories internally on the different ways you've sort of manipulated the large language model. I'm a prompt but, goddess. <laughs> just tell you that, right? The analogy <laughs> would be, do you walk into Subway? Do you walk into Jimmy John's, Jersey Mike's, pick your favorite sub shop and say, I want a sandwich and just wait for them to make you a sandwich. And don't don't tell me if you order by number, then my analogy doesn't work. But let's say you just say, I want a sandwich. The poor kid behind the counter doesn't know what to make you, right? So what do you do? You say white or wheat or Italian herbs and cheese. You say, what kind of meat do I want? 
what kind of vegetables, how much, do I want avocado, that's extra, do I want honey mustard or chipotle or mayo, do I want some oregano seasoning, you're very prescriptive with what you want on that sandwich. It's the same way with AI prompts. It seems silly to compare the two, but if you're not descriptive in your prompt, you can get responses that aren't exactly what you're looking for. Well, and I would add to that because I, I really do have legit prompting skills, I will say. People <laughs> come to me and say, bro, I can't get what I want out of this. I'm like, here, let me show you how. Um, you can revise prompts. So if people don't realize that if if you get the the answer that you're not looking for, you can say that's not exactly right add this thing or do this additional thing or exclude this data or whatever and and so it can be an iterative process and you can go back you can you can hop between prompts you can go back and and you can you can change things uh, and so for me I, I mean i will tell you that in any given day i probably am using an ai tool that i'm prompting a hundred times in a day, it's a lot. A hundred. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> um, I also say please and thank you every mm -hmm. time because you know our, our robot overlords when they take over the world. I want to be. Do you notice the responses are kinder when you use kind words in the program? Well, so it's an interesting thing because you know I I did take a class in in AI um, and it was around the business implications of AI and, and this. And the interesting thing is that because these LLMs learn by how you interact with them, if you are polite to them, so if I say, hey, help me craft an email to a customer or to an employee for XYZ, it almost parrots back the the way that you have phrased it so it can be sure. very abrupt or it can be very pleasant now you can also refine it and say and i do this all the time write this like you're speaking to a high schooler and it will revise it and write it like you're speaking to a high schooler my favorite is college student because i feel the high schooler you get a lot of dudes and <laughs> and, and stuff um, but but yes so there there are a lot of ways you can do this i went way off track so, <laughs> so much fun no, so we've named that creative training, or at least I've named that creative training. And I think it's just as important as technical training. If you look at how do I develop an ROI? And, and we're talking a lot about how do you sell this internally as a business leader? There's a cost to AI. Well, developing that AI, that ROI, excuse me, acronym jumble. Um, we'll even show some metrics at the end of the presentation here that, that we can expand on to help develop those uh, against your internal numbers. Yeah, I would, I would say, um, you know, the security piece is is not meant to be scary, but I'll, I do think that Copilot is going to give organizations a chance to really enhance their security because oh, yeah. we're going to be right. automating a lot. We're going to be, um, you know, strengthening our security. Security uh, policies are going to be getting automatically applied as we use these tools. So I do think it's an opportunity if done right and prepared to really uh, increase your security posture. Absolutely. So I, th I think to to layer on that, the security training for users is more important than ever because what you don't want to do is, you know, if you have a default security label that is everything is public, publicly available, um, that doesn't mean you're sharing it with the public, but if it gets out, it's publicly available. If the mindset is, I'm just going to select that every time, you you could really easily run into a scenario where a user has created a document, they've tagged it as being publicly available, and now it's it's discoverable by by Copilot. And and so I think really training users on how you use labels and what those labels should be used for. You know, you can do some stuff around automating, you know, certain keywords. We have customers that say, you know, they they are, are doing drug research or something and they every time a, a code name for a project is they want it to be labeled confidential. Mm -hmm. You can do stuff like that. But for the most part, it's up to the user to decide what what it's going to be labeled as. And so I think when we talk about that security first mindset, it's going to be really, really important that your users understand, and that should be part of your onboarding process. And go through some sort of security training, and here's how we use security. I, I just think that step can't be missed. I think also in preparing your team, 
Um, I come from an ERP system implementation background, and so we we always identified a user in in ERP system implementations that would be the pallet user. Um, I I think that that should be done and you should identify people that are going to be champions within the user community and that can help with that prompting because the last thing you want to do is roll out you know last thing you want to do is spend thirty dollars per user per month which you have to pay annually up front um, on something people get it and they try and use it and they're like oh this is junk i'm just not going to do it that would be a disaster so all of these things become really 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 important Absolutely, and I'm going to transition the slide because you're sort of bridging that gap right. to as a, as the organization changes, how do you change the mindset of the organization to adapt to new technologies? Yeah, uh, so embracing change is important. Um, change is really, really hard. It just is. Um, you know, you do things like redesign a user interface and that can cause real chaos in your organization it just can't mm -hmm. you move this button from over here to over here and that can set, send people into an absolute tailspin so change is really really hard and some people are going to push back and some people aren't i like to think that the it folks in the organization um, are going to embrace this and it's going to be super exciting that's not always going to be the case so so we just you need to recognize that you're going to have to pull some people along on this and and you just are the key is going to be back to that previous slide you got to educate 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 um, what i would say is as much as you can invest in people having them understand how ai works particularly llms the better and then it's not such a mystery and it honestly makes things a little bit easier from a prompting perspective um, I think it's going to be important to to continually look at at what has been released and what functionality is available because like everything you know what we're using today isn't the end state and there probably isn't an end state for this mm -hmm. so there are things that you know we're, we're complaining about with copilot today that won't exist probably i say six months maybe next week it's hard to say um, so i think looking at both the technology and what's changing and making sure you have an, a continuous improvement loop to layer those changes back in both from a technology perspective but also from a business perspective like what can you look at to to say okay if i were to use copilot in this scenario how could i make it more efficient i think that you have to be able to monitor it you need to set real key milestones around okay we have deployed copilot to a customer service group is there a measurable impact to how quickly they can respond and the accuracy with which they respond to customers is is a great example of that or we have deployed copilot to a support team are they able to resolve more tickets how many more and and really really measure that it's like anything you, you just mm -hmm. you have to measure it um, the other thing, and I think this is really important, is people are really excited about this technology. Like, like it was like Christmas here that that when that notice went out that it was available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you need to do this, and you need to do this to stay competitive because your competitors are are implementing Copilot or some some tool. I, I promise you that they are. Uh, but more than that. Your people want to use the tools, and if you're not investing in your people and their skills, and Copilot is one of these, particularly from a technology perspective, they're going to leave. They're, people want to work with tools and on things that they find fun and exciting, and they're going to leave. So I, I think that as I think about it, I would never put the brakes on this other than for security reasons anyway, but it's something that we have to do as an organization to remain competitive and to keep our people. And, and those two things are both really, really important. Yeah, so. absolutely. And I think you don't even have to take just our word for it. We got another slide here that I wanted to talk through or highlight a couple key bullet points to hit on Rose item. The, the right hand column 
drew out a couple of data points uh, that you just talked about, 30%. Well, let me back up to what, what was the early access program? Some people know, some people don't. So Microsoft had a early access release of Copilot to 600 organizations. These are large enterprises at the global level uh, included in that 600 program. And then they pulled those users. They monitored, they had continuous feedback, and they, they tracked the productivity gains or the feedback at the user level of being able to use Copilot in the workplace. And to your point, Ro, 30% of people are saying they're going to say access to Copilot would influence what role they take at an organization. I don't doubt that for a moment. Three out of 10. And then I, I sort of laughed at the other two on the right hand column said, I'm a sales guy, so I like free lunches, right? So we all know the cost of a Chipotle catered lunch or buying pizzas for the team. Almost four out of five people now say they'd rather have Copilot over a free lunch. Oh, I mean, what I take from this is nobody wants to write that first draft. <laughs> <laughs> right? I did love that 85% to get to a good first draft faster. Yeah. But we're not on camera right now, but hand up if you're guilty of saying, oh, I don't even know where to start, so I'll do that later. It's, it's amazing. And that's across applications. So, that's and that, that's why I say 100 times a day, I'm I'm in there. To get something started. To get something started. Yep. Just get it started, hand it to somebody, go, this is what I want. If you look at the lifespan of a project, the longest phase is typically the getting started phase. Yep. Once yep. you're started, now you're rolling, right? I think salespeople on the line, salespeople on my team that might have joined are probably looking at the last four. You know, if you can keep CRM up to date with 68% less effort, you get less phone calls from me saying, hey, we need to fix your CRM uh, forecast, right? There's a lot here, and, and part of this, again, is all building an ROI. The The free lunch is funny, but that first stat, 70% said they were more productive. If you can make a user in your organization with a tool at $30 a month, 70% more productive, let's start there for building the ROI and justifying the underlying projects we've talked about. I'm expecting a whole lot out of both sales and, and delivery now. You know, they're going to be 70 percent more. Productive. Maybe we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I think these are eye popping numbers. There's more of these as part of the Jumpstart program we have with Microsoft uh, Copilot, with Microsoft 365 Copilot. Uh, we even have ROI calculators that we can help you build out this analysis to present to your leadership to again justify not just the spend of Copilot, but the underlying security initiatives that are so strongly recommended should be required. That's that's the way I'll phrase that. So I th think we've done. We've got eight minutes. Pretty good on timing. We got eight minutes. I'll, I will highlight something we've referenced uh, a few times here today, our Copilot readiness assessment. So this was built starting back in May of 2023. And as I talk about this, if you do have questions, please drop them into the chat. We'll get to at least a couple. And if we can't get to all of them, we will make sure to follow up uh, individually uh, to your questions. Um, so our co-pilot readiness assessment, you can use this link here. I believe Christina is moderating and dropping a, an actionable link into the chat as well. Um, but we built this hand in hand with Copilot engineers at Microsoft. So when I talk about the holistic data estate, when I talk about looking at your specific use cases and user profiles, uh, we cover those areas. But typically what we want to start with, what is AI? What is a large language model? I give you an overview of the tool set, the semantic index, the Microsoft graph, how purview layers into your controls there, what it's really going to do the minute you turn it on in your environment. Then we're building out your use cases, defining these ROIs, looking at the purview stack, analyzing your licensing today. There's underlying uh, prereqs from a licensing perspective. So A, what licensing do we have? B, how much of it are we leveraging? And both from a required and a recommended perspective, you're required to have certain tools enabled, but then it's recommended to have certain tools in use, like advanced DLP policies, or let's say DLP policies not in audit mode actually actioning them in your environment. And yes, we've seen that. Um, so these are common scenarios that we pull out in a co-pilot readiness assessment. And then we can even help with your communication to your end users, making sure it's clear, concise, branded from your IT group uh, and training your end users themselves. And of course, if you have further questions and would like to talk to us, um, we have a sales at synergy-technical.com alias. Um, Christina, I believe can drop in 
my email address here as well, dfin at synergy-technical.com. If you're, or if you have an account exec that you already work with, please feel free to reach out to them. They only know how to talk co-pilot this week. I'm sure they're ready for the weekend, <laughs> but we got another day and a half, so hold on tight. Um, so I'm going to look at my computer to gather a couple questions and again, send them in if you have them. We'll get to as many as we can in a couple minutes here. Um, so one, I don't know if you guys know the answer to this one. Can I have Copilot adhere to my corporate branding standards? Um, not yet. So, so the answer to that is that's something that is being worked on. And let me expand on that because that's a question that we get from our marketing team. Um, it, it's something when I'm producing a, a presentation, it's important to me. What that really means is I'm uploading a, a document and I want to use that document to create a PowerPoint. And you know, by default, Copilot's going to go out and it's going to make some publicly, it's going to use the PowerPoint design feature um, and it's going to use publicly available pictures and whatnot. But most organizations have branding standards and they have stylized decks that they want to use as templates. Uh, and they have approved corporate assets that they want to be able to to put in. The answer is no, it is not there yet, but it is coming soon. What coming soon means, I don't know, but they said that about Copilot last week. So <laughs> that will be really cool because yes. talk about uh, the 85 percent get to a first draft faster. I am so unskilled in PowerPoint, it's not even funny. Right. Yeah. So if I see I have to drop it into this template, that helps. But if I can have Copilot drop into, I know it's Synergy branded approved. Right. Yeah. I can become a PowerPoint right. king. And the data shows that most people aren't using 90% of what PowerPoint can do. But oh, yeah. when you can yeah. use a tool like Copilot, possibilities. Yeah. I learned, for you, Dan. I learned this new feature of the camera that we're using here today, just yesterday. So thank you, Ro, for that. that Absolutely. Cool tip. So I did have someone text me a that is on that knows us. Um, so they texted me directly the question, <laughs> which appeared on my watch, which is you know, technology Perfect. is amazing. Can I audit Copilot chats and are they discoverable? And the answer there is yes, you can. So it, if you are an organization that that has enabled um, DLP and wants to make sure that Copilot chats are discoverable, you absolutely can do that. And that functionality exists today. So important. But you're going to get a lot of requests in email now. How oh, come I don't have your cell phone? <laughs> it's a very <laughs> text question. You know, having been a CIO for many, many years, my cell phone number is not out in the wild because I didn't want people like you calling me. <laughs> I respect. We call work numbers. Yes. Uh, another question here, can I buy it through Synergy? Uh, thank you for asking, yes, and you should. So um, it is available through us. Um, obviously speak to your account executive or reach out to us uh, to get connected with one uh, on how to do so. If you have an existing CSP agreement, we can add them today. Let's talk about the security controls we just talked about for an hour first, uh, but we can add them today as low as quantity one. So the old restrictions of a minimum of 300 uh, are completely gone. So. If you don't have a CSP agreement with us, you, we can get one on file pretty quick and then you have the access to all of the uh, additional services that we offer through our license advisory team, um, which is more than just advisory services, but tools like uh, e-learning modules for your office suite. We can embed right into your environment uh, for your end users. So, Well, an important add on to that, why would you want to buy through CSP as opposed to online directly? And that is what people don't necessarily realizes that as a, a CSP, so a cloud solutions provider, if we sell you licensing, we are support for that licensing. So if you buy co-pilot licensing and you need assistance with co-pilot, I don't mean you want us to implement it for you, but you have technical questions or, or whatever, we're your first line of defense as opposed to getting in a queue with Microsoft who I can't even imagine how many co-pilot questions you're getting right now. We have direct lines into engineering. We have direct lines. Um, we have premier agreements, so we can leverage a lot of things that if you buy it online, you just can't do that. And not only that, but if you buy it online, we technically can't support you. Right. That's that's the other side of that. So if you want us to support you, we would love to support you in your co-pilot journey. We really we need to sell you the licensing in order to do that. 
And talk about having access to the team. My 11 o'clock today, we're in the Eastern time zone. My 11 o'clock was with the Jumpstart partner community, the global partner community, analyzing how they've changed their workshops just this week from what I'm going to call Monday evening's announcement. Microsoft's calling it a Tuesday announcement because they had Monday off, but a yeah. Monday evening post. We have one minute. Uh, I do see how much does the readiness assessment cost. I'm going to defer to talk to your synergy team again. Uh, we can be pulled in in a variety of ways for these readiness assessments from an audit to the board from a third party, giving you a copilot readiness score to starting from the top on what is it? Where is my data? How sensitive is it? And what is the risk of data leakage? So it can vary quite a bit. So talk to your sales team. And that's under is a it. minute. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, again, you have our contact information. Christina and our marketing team will be following up with a recording and the slides here today. And thanks again.